During an eight-month period in 1984, Bobby Joe Long abducted, abused and killed at least 10 women in the Tampa Bay area in Florida. He was also reported to have robbed and forced himself on dozens of other women whom he contacted through classified ads. Long's final victim survived her nightmarish experience with him and provided the police with vital information that led to his capture. Lisa McVeigh had already led a life of horrific abuse. Prior to her being snatched by the serial killer, she'd been in and out of foster care and was molested for years by her mother's boyfriend, who reported he carried out the abuse while holding a gun to her head. On November the 3rd of 1984, McVeigh was riding her bike from work to the home of her grandmother, for whom she cared at the time. Long ambushed the teen, blindfolded her and took her to his home. For a period of 26 hours, he repeatedly forced himself on McVeigh and tortured her. While in captivity, the teen committed to memory several details about the circumstances of her abduction and deliberately left her fingerprints throughout the serial killer's home so that the police would be able to easily identify her in the event of her death. McVeigh reportedly agreed to be Long's secret girlfriend and elicited sympathy from her captor by saying she was the only child of a sick man. Long ultimately agreed to release her and took McVeigh to a remote location while she wore a blindfold. He instructed her to take it off after five minutes while he fled. When the teen returned home, she was reportedly beaten and questioned for five hours by her guardian's boyfriend, who demanded to know where she'd been. McVeigh's story remained consistent and law enforcement was called. She gave detectives descriptions of her captor, his vehicle and home, the route they'd taken, a period of time she'd heard him use in an ATM, and other details which proved instrumental in tracking Long down. He was arrested for McVeigh's kidnapping and abuse on November the 16th of 1984 and connected to his other crimes during the ensuing interrogation process. Less than a year later, he pleaded guilty for the attack on McVeigh, as well as eight counts of first-degree murder, eight counts of kidnapping, and seven counts of battery. He was given 26 life sentences and sentenced to death for one of the murders. McVeigh subsequently became a motivational speaker and a police officer. Given her pre-existing trauma, she'd look back at her time with Long and say, it was nothing new to me and claimed that being forced to fight for her life actually reignited her will to live. McVeigh was present when Long was executed by lethal injection on May the 23rd of 2019. Number 6. Natasha Latour Between April of 2021 and September of 2022, at least six fatal shootings took place in Stockton and Oakland, California. The incidents were carried out under similar circumstances and were linked together through ballistic tests. When the victims were gunned down, they were typically alone in dimly lit areas at night or in the early morning hours. The killings, which weren't robbery or gang-related, were eventually tied to a single man, 43-year-old Stockton resident Wesley Brownlee. He was arrested in the early hours of October the 15th of 2022 while driving through Stockton with a mask and gun in his possession. Chief Stanley McFadden told the media in the immediate aftermath that officers had observed Brownlee's movements while he was driving and deduced he was out hunting and on a mission to kill. As of the latest updates on the matter, prosecutors were seeking the death penalty for the accused killer. Instrumental in identifying Brownlee was his only known surviving victim, Natasha Latour, a homeless woman in her late 40s. In the early hours of April the 16th of 2021, she was at an encampment in Park and Union Streets in Stockton, where she spotted a man wearing dark clothing and a face mask, pointing a gun at her from near her tent. She charged him in an attempt to defend herself, but he started shooting. In a subsequent interview, Latour recalled, there were no words exchanged, didn't come any closer, didn't say anything, just started shooting. I saw, I saw flashes. Latour reported that she was shot about 10 times and described the feeling by saying, there's a burning that's incredible. You're wet all over and you don't know why you're wet. Latour was able to crawl away from the scene and scream for help until she was found by a motorist. 
who called 911. After Latour was treated for her gunshot wounds, she provided law enforcement with a description of the suspect's height, weight and gender, which they were able to use towards identifying Brownlee. Number 5. Fabienne Witherspoon On May the 13th of 1992, Fabienne Witherspoon was walking to a friend's apartment in Charleston, North Carolina when she saw a man in his late twenties under an overpass with a sign that read, I will work for food. The man showed Witherspoon, who was 19 years old at the time, a photo of his family and she felt sympathy towards him. The teenager decided to give him clothes and food from her friend's home. She asked the panhandler to wait for her outside. The man who'd become the focus of Witherspoon's generosity was Tommy Lynn Sells and by that point, it killed over a dozen people, often in gruesome fashion. As Witherspoon looked through her friend's home for items to give cells, he made his way inside and armed himself with a kitchen knife. Witherspoon spoke for the first time on the attack that followed during the 2021 interview with 2020. Cells locked the door and came up behind her with the blade, telling the teen that she wouldn't be hurt as long as she did what he said. Witherspoon complied at first. She recounted thinking to herself, okay, I'll get through this, I'll get through this, and then he'll leave, and then everything will be okay. When Cells forced her into the bathroom and told her he was going to abuse her, Witherspoon fought back. As he pushed her up against the toilet, she grabbed a ceramic duck and struck him in the head repeatedly. During the struggle that ensued, the teenager gained control of the knife and stabbed the serial killer multiple times, hitting his liver, kidney, and slicing his testicle. And then I felt something crashing down over my head, Witherspoon said, describing the moment as the last thing she remembered before she regained her senses to see first responders in front of the home. Cells had struck her in the head with a piano stool, leaving her with a gaping wound. Witherspoon had also suffered an injury to her hand that required surgery to mend. After pummeling the teen, Cells tried to escape, but his injuries proved too severe and he ended up in the ICU and in police custody. Unfortunately, his serial killer status was unknown at the time. He pleaded guilty to malicious wounding and served five years for the attack on the teenager. Sells claimed at least 10 more victims following his release. Witherspoon told 2020, I felt like it was my fault that he only got five years. She remembered reading that because of their fight, Sells went after smaller and more vulnerable victims as he didn't want to risk being hurt again. Witherspoon claimed that even though there were people calling her a hero, she regretted not having done more to keep Sells behind bars. Number 4. Julie Rea Harper Sells killed again within months of his release from prison for the attack on Witherspoon. On October the 13th of 1997, he donned a ski mask and broke into a home in Lawrenceville, Illinois, where he stabbed Joel Kirkpatrick to death as he slept. Alerted by the commotion, Julie Rea Harper, Kirkpatrick's mother, went to her son's bedroom and fought Sells off before fleeing. The bloody knife, which had been taken from the woman's kitchen, was found in front of the bedroom. Even though she'd survived her close call with Sells, the ramifications of the attack would prove disastrous for Rhea Harper, as she was wrongfully indicted for her son's killing. In spite of the woman maintaining her innocence, the prosecution argued that she'd fabricated the scuffle with the masked intruder. The evidence was largely based on the testimony of blood-stained pattern analysts and the potential motive was cited as a bitter custody dispute in which the woman was embroiled with her ex. Kirkpatrick's blood had actually transferred to the woman's clothes during her fight with Sells. On March the 4th of 2002, the jury found Julie Rea guilty and the judge sentenced her to 65 years in prison. Sells claimed more victims after Kirkpatrick and before he was arrested in early January of 2000. He was confirmed to have killed 22 people, although law enforcement suspected the number was much higher. He confessed to murdering Kirkpatrick in 2004, leading to Rhea Harper being acquitted and exonerated. Sells 
who'd become known as the coast-to-coast -coast killer due to his widespread area of activity, was executed at Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville on April the 3rd of 2014. Number three, Leah Pallian. On February the 8th of 2024, Denise Olias Aranchibia was found dead at the Soho 54 Hotel in Lower Manhattan, New York City. 38-year-old Olias Arancibia was a single mother who was working as an escort to support herself and her child. Investigators determined that she'd been hired by 28-year-old Rad Almansori, who strangled her and smashed her skull with an iron in the hotel room. CCTV captured him walking the street while wearing the victim's leggings in the aftermath. Al Mansouri fled to Phoenix, Arizona, where he stabbed a 22-year-old woman and stole her car on February the 17th. The following day, he went to a suburban McDonald's and followed a female employee into the restroom. He tried to abuse her, and when she screamed, stabbed her three times in the neck with an orange-handled knife. Both stabbing victims survived, and upon his arrest, Al Mansouri reportedly told the police, not a single woman on this planet likes me before admitting to the previous attacks and boasting about the New York City killing. The authorities believe that, if not for his capture, Al Mansouri was undoubtedly going to become a serial killer. He confessed that he'd planned to kill an Uber driver and steal their car in order to carry out the murder of his mother and stepfather, burning the house down. Al Mansouri had shown signs of his murderous nature before, having been arrested over a dozen times between 2016 and 2023 in Arizona, Texas, and Florida for crimes that included assault and kidnapping. In the wake of Oleus Arancibia's murder, 26-year-old Florida woman Leah Pallian spoke to the media about her close call with Al Mansouri in April of 2023. At the time, they were working together at an upscale Orlando restaurant. After learning that he'd been biking to work following the breakdown of his car, Pallian offered to give Al Mansouri rides to and from work. One night in April, she let him sleep on her couch after he claimed that he was going to pick up his car from the shop in the morning. Al Mansouri's behavior towards the woman shifted dramatically while he was in her home. While inebriated, he insulted Pallian and told her things to the effect that her father didn't love her. Pallian went to sleep as Al Mansouri was reportedly too drunk to be kicked out at the time. He passed out on the couch, but Pallian awoke in the morning to him curled in bed beside her. Al Mansouri reportedly told Pallian that he loved her, but given the events of the previous night, the woman promptly rejected his advances and asked him to leave. In the moments that followed, he grabbed her phone, unlocked it by holding it up to her face, and blocked several men with whom he believed she was flirting. He then locked her front door, shut the blinds, and screamed that he was going to kill her. Pallian told the New York Post that Al Mansouri approached her with this blank look in his eyes, mounted her, and started strangling her while reportedly repeating, I hate that I have to do this. I hate that I have to kill you. Pallian claimed that Al Mansouri knew exactly what he was doing as he'd rapidly restricted her breathing. He eventually released his grip and told the woman, You made the devil come out of my body. Pallian recounted that nearly strangling her to death had aroused Al Mansouri, who then forced her to perform an intimate act on him. He reportedly gave her a pinky promise that he wasn't going to kill her afterwards. She complied and following the assault, they got into Pallian's car and went to the auto body shop. Pallian later recounted that during the drive, Al Mansouri became hyper fixated on a song that he'd been playing, which was reportedly about how to get away with murder. Pallian convinced him to stop and allow her to use a 7-Eleven restroom. The woman then locked herself inside and called the police. Al Mansouri went looking for her, banged on the locked door and got a manager to open the stall. Upon hearing keys jingling at the door, Pallian told the manager, No, don't let him in. This man just tried to kill me. I'm on the phone with 911. Al Mansouri fled with Pallian's vehicle, which he was still driving when he was arrested in Sumter County about a day later. Pallian was certain that it would be an open and closed case, 
but was later shocked to learn that the battery and aggravated assault charges weren't pursued, allegedly due to insufficient evidence, and only the Grand Theft Auto charge remained. Pallion felt that the police hadn't taken her concerns seriously when she told them if you let this man walk with a slap on the wrist, he's going to become the next Ted Bundy. Her warnings weren't heeded, and with the violent charges gone, Al Mansouri was able to travel to New York City, where he killed Oleas Arancibia. On February 7th, the night of the murder, Pallion received a FaceTime call from an unknown number. It was Al Mansouri who'd violated a no-contact order to reach out to her. When asked by a terrified Pally and why he was calling, he answered, I just wanted to see how you felt about everything between us. Al Mansouri promptly ended the call. She later attributed her abuser's rampage to failures of Florida's justice system, adding, they have blood on their hands. Hey, it's Carl. Be sure to subscribe and leave your comments in the comments section below and maybe, just maybe, we'll get your video going next. Number 2. Kate Moore Over the course of a little over a month in fall of 1986, Australian serial killer couple David and Catherine Burney kidnapped, abused and murdered four women. The victims were Mary Nielsen, Susanna Candy, Nolene Patterson, and Denise Brown, ranging in ages from mid-teens to early 30s. The couple typically kidnapped the victims at knife point and took them to their home at 3 Morehouse Street in the Perth suburb of Willargi. They were then abused by 35-year-old David, usually as Catherine watched, and killed by strangulation with the nylon cord in some cases after they were force-fed sleeping pills. In the murder of teenager Candy, David asked Catherine to finish her off as a way of proving her undying love for him. She obliged, later stating that she didn't feel anything when she strangled Candy with a nylon cord. Speaking of David, Catherine, who was also in her mid-thirties at the time of the murder spree, stated, I was prepared to follow him to the end of the earth and do anything to see that his desires were satisfied. On November the 7th of 1986, teenager Kate Moi accepted a ride from the couple, who used aliases when addressing her. At some point, David brandished a knife and Moi was taken to the Moore House address. She was forced to call her mother to say she was going to spend the night at a friend's house. Moi did as commanded and told her mother that she'd had too much to drink, hoping that the woman would catch on that she was in an emergency given the fact that she didn't drink. When the teen asked the couple if they were going to abuse or kill her, they reportedly replied that if she was good, they'd only do the former. At the home, she was forced to dance for them and sleep in their bed, handcuffed to David. The following day, after David had gone to work, Catherine answered the door to conduct a drug deal, but forgot to chain Moi to the bed. The teen broke a window lock and jumped out, hitting her head on the concrete. She was also attacked by David's dog before she made her way to a vacuum cleaner shop where she told the owner that she'd been abused. When the teenager recounted her ordeal for the police, she was reportedly met with skepticism, but 22-year-old Constable Laura Hancock never doubted her. Given the amount of information she'd provided, including the couple's address and phone number, in spite of the Bernie's attempts at concealing their identities, Moi had read David's name from a medicine bottle. She described a drawing she'd concealed in the house as proof that she'd been there and also noted that the couple had watched the movie Rocky on the day of her abduction. When the police searched David and Catherine's home, they found the drawing and the Rocky cassette in their VCR. Following their arrest, the couple gave law enforcement conflicting stories, with Catherine saying they'd never met Moi and David claiming she'd willingly come to their home to have consensual relations. When pressed further, David confessed and also revealed where their previous victims had been buried. David and Catherine were each sentenced to four terms of life imprisonment. On October the 7th of 2005, David was found dead in his cell 
at Corzarina Prison with a length of cord around his neck. Following requests from the victim's families, Catherine had her papers marked never to be released. In 2009, with her subsequent appeals and bids for parole denied. We will line up our release from a while back about when bad blood goes wrong straight after number one. Stick around if you'd like to watch that one as well still. Number one, Tracy Edwards. On the night of July the 22nd of 1991, a man with a pair of handcuffs dangling from his wrist flagged down a Milwaukee police car in a panic. 32-year-old Tracy Edwards told officers Robert Routh and Rolf Mueller that a freak had placed the handcuffs on him. The officer's keys didn't match the brand of restraints Edwards had on and he agreed to accompany the officers back to the apartment from which he'd fled. Edwards would later learn that he'd narrowly escaped becoming the 18th victim of Jeffrey Dahmer also known as the Milwaukee Monster, one of the most deranged serial killers in US history. Roughly five hours before he'd flagged down the police car, Edwards had accepted $100 from Dharma to take nude photos, drink beer, and keep him company at his apartment. The man immediately noticed a foul odor, which he'd later describe as the smell of death upon entering the home. Dharma distracted Edwards by having him look at his tropical fish and tried to handcuff him, but only managed to get one wrist. Edwards was confused and resisted, but nonetheless agreed to follow Dharma to the bedroom where a tape of The Exorcist 3 was playing and where there was a 57-gallon drum from which a foul smell emanated. The serial killer then brandished a large knife and told Edwards that he was going to take nude photos of him. Fearing for his life, the man complied and started unbuttoning his shirt but began mentally planning an escape. At one point, Dharma placed his head on Edwards's chest, listened to his heartbeat, and while pressing the knife against his body, said that he was going to eat his heart. Edwards tried to calm Dharma down by saying that he was his friend and assured him he wasn't going to run away. He then asked that they drink beer in the living room where there was air conditioning and the serial killer agreed. While they were on the couch, Edwards asked to use the bathroom. When he rose, he noticed that Dharma wasn't holding onto the handcuffs. The would-be victim punched him in the face, knocking the serial killer off balance and fled out the front door. When he returned with the officers, Dharma invited them inside the apartment and admitted he'd handcuffed Edwards, offering to free him with a key that he kept in the bedroom. Dharma provided no explanation for his actions. Edwards recounted that he'd been threatened with a knife and the blade was found under the bed in an open drawer. Mueller noticed that there was a multitude of Polaroid pictures, the majority of which showed dismembered human bodies. Mueller deduced that the photos had been captured in the same apartment in which they were standing. He showed them to Ralph, saying, these are for real. At that point, Dharma tried to fight the cops, but he was promptly subdued and restrained. As Mueller pinned Dharma to the floor, Ralph opened his fridge and saw the freshly severed head of a black male on the bottom shelf. Following his arrest, Dharma waived his right to an attorney and offered a full confession of his murder, saying, I created this horror and it only makes sense I do everything to put an end to it. When the Milwaukee Police's Criminal Investigation Bureau conducted a more thorough search of apartment 213 at 924 North 25th Street, one examiner stated that it was more like dismantling a museum the House of Horrors held body parts from Dharma's victims that included preserved male organs in jars, severed hands, disembodied hearts, two full skeletons, four severed heads in the kitchen, and a total of seven skulls, some bleached and some painted. 
Inside the drum gallon that Edwards had spotted in the bedroom, there were three dismembered torsos dissolving in acid. When asked about the preservation of the skulls and skeletons, Dharma claimed that they were supposed to be part of an altar he'd planned to make in his living room. Edwards had come incredibly close to a gruesome death. In some cases, Dharma had injected boiling water or acid into his victims' brains before killing them. He posed naked with the victims' bodies, performed acts of self-gratification with their remains and visceria, sometimes as he dismembered them and also confessed to eating some of their body parts. Dharma explained the latter by saying, I suppose in an odd way it made me feel they were even more of a permanent part of me. Edwards played a central role during Dharma's trial, at the end of which the latter was convicted on 16 counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to a total of 941 years in prison. During his incarceration, Dharma was beaten to death with a metal bar by another inmate in November of 1994, as a lawyer for Edwards would later argue his life was completely destroyed by his close call with Dharma. In the years that followed, he struggled with drugs, alcohol, and homelessness, and was arrested for crimes that included drug possession, theft, and property damage. On July the 26th of 2011, he was accused of taking part in a crime that involved throwing a man to his death off a Milwaukee bridge. Edwards, who was homeless at the time, helped another man in killing the victim following an argument. He was sentenced to one and a half years in jail and two years of extended supervision for aiding a felon. Edwards' whereabouts following the completion of his sentence remained unknown as of late 2022. An ill-fated love triangle formed in the summer of 2021 when Englishman Mark Meadows began a romantic affair with Banbury resident Louise Grieve, who at the time was also in a relationship with a man named Keith Green. Meadows and Grieve continued to see each other in secret into the fall. In September, Green reportedly caught the two lovers in the midst of one of their trysts at the Howard Road home he shared with his girlfriend. Green subsequently moved out for a few months, but Grieve begged him to come back, so he did. Despite their household having been restored, the relationship between Green and Grieve gradually declined as the latter continued to meet and exchange flirtatious messages with Meadows, whom she lovingly referred to as Jesus because of his long hair and beard. On February the 13th of 2022, the situation finally came to a head. Grieve, Meadows and the latter's half-brother, Travis Gorton, had spent the night at a pub around the corner from the Howard Road residence. Shortly after 11 p.m., the trio went back to the house. While Grieve, who was reportedly intoxicated, went inside, Meadows and Gorton laid in wait for Green, who'd been relegated to sleeping in the shed outside the house itself. It was outside this shed that the half-brothers accosted the man, stabbing him at least eight times before leaving him to die in the back garden. Gorton told an acquaintance, Ryan Cope, about the fatal altercation, saying, it became a bit of a brawl, so I don't know if it was me or Mark or the both of us, but there were multiple stabs. Cope, who'd refused to aid the half-brothers in their plot to eliminate Meadows' love rival, contacted the police about what he'd heard. Officers showed up at Meadows' home in the early hours of the following morning. They reportedly came across one of the murder weapons as well as blood-stained clothes hidden near his bed. Both Meadows and Gorton were taken into custody on murder charges the following month. Grieve was also arrested after investigators had analyzed text messages in which she'd allegedly inflamed the tensions between her dueling partners and did nothing to peacefully resolve the situation. In the end, both Meadows and Gorton were jailed for life with their minimum terms set at 23 and 17 years respectively. Grieve, meanwhile, was found guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter for which she was given an eight-year prison sentence. Number five. Cameron Dunn and Delano Samuels. A brutal gang-related attack unfolded on the streets of Smedwick in West Midlands, England on May the 1st of 2021, as was captured by CCTV cameras. 17-year-old Delano Samuels was stabbed twice with a Rambo-style machete before fleeing down Waterloo Road and entering a nearby shop to take refuge. 
His assailant, later identified as 19-year-old Cameron Dunn, pursued him inside and cornered him in a storeroom. Dunn proceeded to stab the teen several more times, embedding the tip of the blade in the victim's head before fleeing the scene. Samuels stumbled out of the shop and managed to get into a car parked outside. The vehicle was found minutes later after having crashed on Heath Street. Samuels was lying lifelessly on the ground next to the disabled car. He was rushed to the hospital where he was ultimately pronounced dead. Investigators reviewed surveillance footage and identified Dunn as the perpetrator of the broad daylight attack. During the court proceedings, Dunn indicated he'd been acting in self-defense, but his claims were roundly disputed by the evidence presented. He was convicted of murder in March of 2022. A few months later, during a hearing at Wolverhampton Crown Court, Dunn was given a life sentence with the possibility of early release after 19 years. Number 4. Rachel Wade and Sarah Ludman For several months, Florida women Rachel Wade and Sarah Ludman were entrenched in a contentious romantic rivalry, stemming from their mutual interest in a man by the name of Joshua Camacho. The latter had previously been involved with Wade before ending their relationship and sparking one up with Ludman. Police records indicated that law enforcement spoke with Wade six times regarding public confrontations of her ex within the first six months of his relationship with Ludman. The war in women routinely harassed one another, including by showing up at the other's place of work, as well as bombarding each other with threatening phone calls, texts, and voicemail messages. After months and months of vicious taunts and bickering, tensions finally reached a fever pitch. On the night of April the 14th of 2009, while Wade was out walking her dog, she allegedly heard a car honk, followed by Ludman yelling, Stay away from my man! Wade subsequently exchanged heated text with Camacho, who was at the time playing video games with Ludman at home. The latter then went with several of her friends to a Pinellas Park McDonald's, where she was informed that her rival was at an acquaintance's house just around the corner. Ludman decided to confront her. As she was driving over, Wade called her and shouted, I'm going to stab you and your Mexican boyfriend. Upon Ludman's arrival, she allegedly came quite close to hitting Wade with her vehicle. She slammed on her brakes and got out with her fists flailing. Allegedly fearing for her safety, Wade produced a steak knife she had brought with her from home and stabbed Ludman in the shoulder and chest. Immediately following the stabbing, witnesses reported seeing Wade chuck the knife over a neighbor's house before calmly stating, I'm done. When emergency crews arrived at the scene, Ludman was rushed to Northside Hospital, where she was pronounced dead from a heart puncture. Wade, who started crying upon being informed of her rival's death, was taken into police custody on a charge of second-degree murder. She was booked at the Pinellas County Jail, where she remained until the conclusion of her trial in September of 2010. Although the defense team contended that Wade had been acting in self-defense during the fatal altercation, it was the months of threatening voicemails in which the defendant repeatedly expressed her desire to kill Ludman that ultimately sealed her fate. She was convicted of murder and sentenced to 27 years in state prison. Number 3. Joseph Ma and Brian Sorrell A tempestuous disagreement among family members from Prague Oklahoma ultimately turned deadly in August of 2022. Court records revealed that Joseph Ma had been living in a camper parked on the north end of his mother's driveway on Summer Trail Road. On August 2nd, however, Ma's mother and her boyfriend, Brian Sorrell, confronted the man about his drug use and reportedly asked him to leave the property. They locked the house to prevent Ma from going inside, which angered him and caused their heated argument to flare up. As tensions escalated, Ma's mother left to sit in her car while her son and Sorrel continued their shouting match. From her vantage point inside the vehicle, the woman told police she saw her son reach for a holstered firearm, then heard a gunshot ring out. Sorrel ran from the camper screaming that he'd been shot. His girlfriend called 911 after he began gasping for air and collapsed to the ground. By the time emergency medical services arrived, however, Sorrel had already succumbed to the gunshot wound. During questioning, Ma allegedly told police multiple different stories. At one point, he told them he blacked out and couldn't remember what happened and that the gun just went off. He was detained at the Potawatomi County Safety Center on a charge of first-degree murder. As of the case's latest updates, the legal proceedings were still ongoing. Number 2. Rowan Lee and Philip Talbot 
British man Rowan Lee left home on April the 19th of 2021 after telling his wife Georgina he was going to visit his grandmother's grave, which was in fact a lie. 30-year-old Lee actually went out to find Philip Talbot, a man whom he suspected of being romantically involved with his wife. Talbot had reportedly met Georgina at the hospital where they both worked. They became close friends, which greatly upset Lee, who confronted his wife with accusations that she was having an affair. Georgina admitted to meeting up with Talbot and even exchanging explicit messages, but denied ever having intercourse with him. As time passed, Georgina and Talbot stayed in touch while Lee fell deeper and deeper into a depression which was only worsened by his heavy drinking. On the 19th of April, having decided to eliminate the man he viewed as a love rival, Lee drove his wife's Ford Focus directly into Talbot's Vauxhall Astra on Bam Furlong Lane near Cheltenham. He then emerged from the vehicle with a knife in hand and attacked Talbot. The latter drove off, but Lee gave chase, eventually ramming into the victim's car again, sending it into a ditch. Lee then armed himself with an ax and attacked Talbot again, inflicting injuries to the man's hands and torso. Talbot fortunately survived. While his attacker was arrested on a charge of attempted murder in court, Lee admitted that in the days leading up to the incident, he'd legitimately wanted to kill Talbot. However, on the day of the attack, he claimed to have had a change of heart and had gone after his rival with the sole intention of chopping his fingers off because they'd been all over his wife. Lee admitted malicious wounding as well as dangerous driving, but a jury found him not guilty of the attempted murder charge. In December of 2022, he was sentenced to an aggregate total of seven years and four months behind bars. Number one, Tashara Jackson and Jacqueline Nicole Shabazz. A long-standing feud involving two female U.S. Postal Service mail carriers from Newport News, Virginia, came to a violent conclusion on April the 7th of 2021. According to official reports on the matter, Tashara Jackson and Jacqueline Nicole Shabazz, for various alleged reasons, simply didn't like each other. The two women thus had multiple contentious exchanges leading up to the April incident. In March, the mail carriers reportedly argued outside a nail salon because while Jackson was inside the establishment, Shabazz had used a pocket knife to slash her tires. A few days later, Jackson retaliated by vandalizing her rival's car while she and her family were out of town for Easter weekend. When Shabazz returned home, she found that her tires had been slashed, portions of the vehicle had been spray-painted red, and an undisclosed object had been stuffed inside the gas tank. Shabazz and her husband, Sal, learned that Jackson had plans to attend a party at Harpoon Larry's restaurant on April the 6th. The couple went there that night to confront the woman over her vandalism. During the course of their encounter, Sal reportedly brandished a taser at bystanders to keep them away as his wife and Jackson came to blows in the parking lot. In the hours that followed, Shabazz and her four children checked into an extended stay motel in York County, believing that Jackson might seek retribution for the earlier ambush. Sal, meanwhile, stayed behind at the family residence. At about 2 a.m. the following morning, while Sal was on the phone with his wife, somebody knocked on the front door. Shabazz later reported hearing a brief exchange of words over the phone, followed by the sound of gunfire. She immediately ended the call and dialed 911. When emergency services arrived at the Shabazz family home, they found Sal dead from four gunshot wounds. The ensuing investigation led police to Jackson and a co-conspirator named Jeremy Petway. In court, the prosecution produced overwhelming evidence, including text exchanges, cell phone tracking data, and security footage from various sources that implicated both Jackson and Petway in Sal's killing. The defense team countered with the assertion that it was the victim's wife who'd actually arranged a murder in pursuit of a $156,000 life insurance policy. In July of 2022, Circuit Court Judge Gary Mills handed down identical punishments to Jackson and Petway, who were both sentenced to 39 years in prison for the murder conspiracy. Thanks for watching. Would you rather go on a date with a serial killer or spend a month in an asylum for the criminally insane? Let us know in the comments section below.